you very much for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because every time we come together, you grant us understanding in your word. I will pray, no, Lord, today you grant us deeper, higher, greater understanding by your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray, Lord, today that as you enlighten us in your word, that, Lord, will rise up and run with the word and do everything you want us to do in the power of the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, as a result of what you are hearing and learning, we'll be better Christians, better soul winners, better Christian workers, waiting for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, I didn't tell you to sit down. Stand up. Everybody said, Amen. Now I will use you to sit down. We're looking at the word of God today and we're talking about the rapture. When we talk about the rapture, we're talking about the coming of the Lord. Actually, when we talk about the coming of the Lord, that coming of the Lord is divided into two parts. That is the second coming of the Lord. He came the first time. When he came the first time, he came to redeem us. When he's coming the second time, he'll be coming to reign. Number one, to redeem. That has taken place. Number two, is to reign. And that is about to take place. When Jesus came the first time, he came to make sacrifice. That is to die for our sins. But then, now, as we turn away from our sins, and we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved. We're redeemed. Our sins are forgiven. And we have our citizenship in heaven. That means now, as children of God, our eternal home is up there in heaven. And we're expecting the coming of the Lord any time from now. And when the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we, which are alive, shall be caught up together with them, like it happened to Enoch. Going out to heaven without seeing death. Like it happened to Elijah. And he went to heaven without seeing death. Then like Jesus Christ who died. And was buried. And he thought he rose again. And then he appeared to his own disciples. Forty days with many infallible proofs. And then one day, while he was talking to them, he was taken up to heaven. That's what is going to happen to the people of God on that final day. But the rapture is for the overcomers. Let me show you passages of scripture. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, But on that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the earth, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As we talk about the coming of the Lord, the rapture in particular, the Lord Jesus Christ himself referred to that coming, that he is the second coming, a good number of times. I'll show you a few of them in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. As you look at verses 2 and 3 in particular, he used the word go. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Then he used the word come. I will come again. Go, come. And those two verbs are very important. In, in that passage I read to you, and the first part has been fulfilled. He has gone. And he said, when I go, I'll be doing something there. I'll be preparing a place for you. And if the first part of the statement is correct, 
in the first part of the statement has been fulfilled. Then we know the second part is going to be fulfilled. I will come again. And when he comes again, he tells us what is coming to do. To receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's about the rapture. That's the rapture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Now when it says a twinkling of an eye, that means when you blink your eye like this, it's less than, less than a second of time. Because it was blinking like that. And then it says, in the twinkling of an eye. Then it says in that verse 52, at the last trump, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I'll be part of it. We shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about the coming of the Lord. And it says, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory. When Christ died on the cross of Calvary, He purchased our redemption. He purchased our salvation. He purchased our victory. He purchased our triumph. And now we are triumphant in Christ. And we are victorious in Christ. And we're expecting the coming of the Lord. When we keep that victory, that means we're more than conquerors. When you keep the victory that Jesus Christ purchased on the cross of Calvary and gave it to you as a gift, then it means one overcomer. And the rapture is for the conquerors. The rapture is for the overcoming saints. The rapture is for the people that are keeping the victory that God has purchased for giving to us through Jesus Christ. Verse 58, therefore, because of the victory has purchased for you, Therefore, because you can be triumphant in the Lord, therefore, because now you can be more than conqueror in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I mean it from verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He's still talking about the rapture. And here Paul, the apostle, says the believers must not be ignorant. The believers must not be ignorant of the very fact that Jesus came the first time to redeem. is coming the second time to reign. And that second time coming is, uh, is going to have part one, the rapture, and then part two, the advent. And the apostle Paul says, do not be ignorant, beloved brethren, in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord, this will say unto you, not by a new prophecy, not by a modern day prophecy. We say it unto you by the watch of the Lord. That means the Lord himself said so before he went to heaven. The Lord himself said so before he left his disciples. And Paul the apostle said, I'm simply reminding you, 
of the word of the Lord. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, shall not precede them, shall not hinder them that which are asleep for the Lord himself. Not another Jesus, this same Jesus, whom you have seen going up into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him going to heaven. That's why it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, for the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Then we which are alive and remain, shall be cut off together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Will you be there? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. First Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. These are passages referring to the rapture, the coming of the Lord. By some people, it tells us, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. How does the thief come in the night? Unannounced. And many people will be unprepared. And Paul the Apostle says, the day of the Lord is coming like that, unannounced, and many, many people, they're going to be taken by surprise. Because the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman or child, and they shall not escape. But, ye brethren, and not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. For ye, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. To be ready for that coming of the Lord, he says, let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the best pledge of faith and love, and for an element, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. The gathering together unto him, that is the rapture. And he says, we're beseeching you, we're pleading with you, we're preaching to you, and we're helping you, counseling you to move on in the Lord because of our gathering together unto him. And that's another way of saying, watch, be sober, get ready, be prepared for the coming of the Lord. That's exactly what Jesus said. Let's go back to the passage I read to you in Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, I read to you verses 36 all through to 39. Now I'm reading verse 42. Watch therefore, why the therefore? Because the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, and they were marrying again in marriage, and they did not know until Noah entered into the ark. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, that is the way it's going to happen. It will take many, many people by surprise. And then he tells his church, because it will take many people by surprise, watch therefore. In that verse 42, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. He will come, but you do not know the time, the hour, the day. He will come. It was 44. Therefore, be also ready. Get prepared. Be ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, ye, the Son of Man, cometh. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man will come. Come back to verse 42. Watch, therefore, look up here. 
here we are. Hey, suppose that you know we are here, and I took all these mice, I took them all away from here. The keyboard there will take it away, and there's nothing here. Even the, these uh, flowers will take everything away. And then I call you, and I say, watch. You'll ask me a question because you look around, no chairs, no organ, no microphone, no voltage, nothing. The whole place is empty, and you say, watch. You are going to ask me a question, what am I watching over? When the Lord Jesus Christ said, watch, he meant something. He said, there is something valuable. There is something precious. There is something indispensable in your life. There is something. If you lose it, you lose eternity. Watch. What did he mean then by what? What are you watching over? Is there something precious in your life? Is there something significant in your life? Is there something non-negotiable in your life? Is there something so indispensable and so eternally important that the Lord is saying, look at this one, you need it for that coming day. Watch. Number one, watch over your life. The life you live now as a Christian. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now the judge shall live by faith. That life of faith, watch over it. If you don't watch over the life of faith, it will become the life of unbelief. It's very, very easy for anybody to, to go down and to be dragged down from the life of faith unto the life of unbelief. Where you take laws into your hand. And where you are now wanting to do things your own way so that you can have what you ought to have. It happened to Abraham. Abraham, the father of faith, the father of the faithful. And when he was not watching, it was very, very easy to be dragged down from the life of faith to the life of unbelief. Watch over your life, the life of faith. It says, now the judge shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Number two, watch over your love, your love for God. Because at the time of the coming of the Lord, he said so himself, Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 12. Because in equal shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It is very, very easy to move away from love unto lukewarmness. Very easy. You love the Lord with fervency. You love the Lord with the fire of the Spirit in your soul. You love the Lord and you love the things of the Lord. And if you don't watch over that love, very, very easy, you can move away from love and move to lukewarmness. That's why it says, it, it says so by the, because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Number three, watch over your language. Watch over your language. Because you see, the language that we speak, very, very easy once again to move away from the language that is aligned with the word of God and then you move to the language that's aligned with the word of Satan. If you are not very careful and you keep on repeating the language of Satan instead of repeating the language of, of the Savior. That's why it says watch over your language. It tells us in Matthew chapter 12 verse 36. Matthew chapter 12 verse 36. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. What does that mean? Let me explain to you. And there were twelve spies that were sent to the land of Canaan. And these twelve spies, they all came back. They came back with language. Caleb and Joshua came back with language. The ten other spies came back with language. Everybody speaks. Believers speak. Unbelievers speak, saints speak, sinners speak, but our speeches are different. Caleb and Joshua came back on the language of faith. We are well able. Let us go up at once. They are bread for us. We can overcome. The other people came back with their own language, the language of unbelief. No, we are not able. 
were like grasshoppers in their sight, and they are giants and the sons of the Anakims. We cannot watch your language. Watch your language. You are going to cut off that notch. We can not. If you're going to make it at the rapture, watch the language. Watch your language. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror. Let the weak say, I am strong. And in the strength of the Lord, we shall overcome, we shall prevail. Because the word of God will never fail. Watch your language. Jesus said, watch. If there were nothing to watch, what are you watching over? But you watch over your life. You watch over your love. You watch over your language. You watch over your labor. Your labor of love. Now you see many people don't understand that the devil, he doesn't only really fight against your life. He fights against your labor of love. You're laboring for the Lord. And the devil is jealous about that. And then he's trying to do something so that he can, if he cannot get you away from heaven, at least he wants to get you to heaven empty-handed. That then your work is tried, and the fire of the trial will burn up everything. And then you go before God, must I go and empty-handed, not a soul with which to give me, to greet him, lay no trophy at his, at his feet, must I go empty-handed? The devil will fight not only against your life. Not only against your love for God, not only against your language of faith, the devil will fight against your labor of love. And it's those who keep that labor until the very end, those are the people who are going to be rewarded on that final day. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. But that which ye have already, hold fast until I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my works, that's the labor, unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Number five, watch over your liberty. Watch over your liberty. The devil will like to bring you back to bondage. The devil will like to bring you back into captivity. And if he, if he succeeds in doing that, then what are you going to answer when the Lord comes? Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The Lord has set you free from idolatry. Remain in that liberty. The Lord has set you free from pornography. Remain in that liberty. The Lord has set you free from the yoke of bondage. And it says, you are set free from sin. You are set free from the paths of darkness. You are set free from all the powers meditating against your life. Remain in that liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Keep that liberty, watch over your liberty. In first, uh, first Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2 verse 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, you are free. But do not use your freedom for a cloak of covetousness. Number 6, watch over the light. Because of the light in you, if you lose it, if you don't watch over it, it will become darkness. And how terrible will that darkness be? In John chapter 12, John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 35. John chapter 12, verse 35. Here it tells us, then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. If you don't watch over your light, the devil will put it on. But you are saying, this little light of mine, I let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And let your light so shine before me. Declare, you are a Christian. You are following Christ, the light of the world. And do not be ashamed of the light of the gospel. He has given you that light. Let it shine. Because if it becomes darkness, how terrible that darkness will be. And then you will not know where you are going. Number seven, watch over your learning. What you learn. What you learn. You are coming here to the Bible study. 
every Monday, and then uh, you are coming on Sundays to watch it. Watch over what you learn. You see, it is it, when you are here, you are learning the outlines that you have. Where is your outline? Can you receive it or can I see? Okay, thank you very much. Nobody will steal it away from you here. When you get over there, watch over that scene. When temptations arise, watch over that scene. When difficulties arise, watch over it. When false prophets come to you to challenge what you have learned and to take away from you what you have learned, that's the time to watch over what you have learned. And it's not just the pastor alone that is watching over what you are learning. You, that you will watch and nobody, not even a friend, you've learned something. All this is that we're learning every Monday as we come here. And then the challenges of life come. And the problems of life come. It may be a problem from the husband. It may be a problem from the wife. One of them may be threatening, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave you alone. Accept your compromise. That's the time to watch over what you learn. The things you are learning. Mark chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Mark chapter 4, verse 23. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. Take heed to all you see that you are learning and hearing. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And unto, and unto you that hear shall more be given. And so Jesus Christ said, Watch. Watch. Now let me ask you what happens if you have a person that is watching, a person on guard in the night. And then you have, it may be a precious, a precious thing, equipment in that company. And you are employed in that company and you are told you have only one responsibility. You see this equipment here, watch over it. And then at night, when everybody else go to sleep, you also go to sleep. And you forget you are a different person. You are a member, a, a guard, and you have to watch over nothing. All the others that are sleeping, they do not have the responsibility of watching over nothing. You went to sleep and they carried everything away. Then we wake up in the morning. Where is the sea? You are told to watch on. And you said, I'm sorry I fell asleep at night. And the thing is gone. You'll pay for it. You'll be punished for it. The same thing the Lord is telling you. You have something to watch over. Your life, your love, your language, your labor, your liberty, your life, and the things you are learning. Watch over them that nobody will take any of these things away from you. You'll keep them to the end in Jesus' name. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, preparation and perseverance of the overcomers. The overcomers, they prepare and they also persevere. Number two, paying the price to overcome. Paying the price to overcome. Number three, promises and provisions for the overcomer. I come back to number one, preparation and perseverance of the overcomer. You see, as children of God and as a people that want to be overcomers, we need to prepare. Now, when it says prepare, let me show you in the Bible in Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. And I'm reading to you from verse 13. If thou prepare thine heart, that's the first thing to prepare. You prepare your heart. Because out of the heart is the abundance of the mouth speaking. And out of the heart comes the issues of life. And if your life is going to be straightened out, if your life is going to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord, you watch over your heart and you prepare your heart. If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. That's how to prepare. Let not wickedness dwell in your tabernacle. And when you do that, you are preparing for the coming of the Lord. In Luke chapter 1 verse 17, Luke chapter 1 verse 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers 
to the children and in disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, prepared for the coming of the Lord. That's how to prepare. Do you see that verse? What are the things included in getting prepared so that we can be ready for the coming of the Lord? Number one is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. That means if there's conflict in the family, because if there's conflict and fighting and disagreement and discord, God says he hates all those things. And if we're involved in anything that God hates, when Christ comes, we shall not be ready. And so, part of the preparation, you as a preacher, you as a counselor, and you as a communicator of the gospel, you are turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, of the children to the fathers. And then it says, number two, and in disobedience to the wisdom of the just, you are turning disobedient people to the wisdom of the just. That is, the just, who are the just? They're the people who say are forgiven. And now they're living a just life, a righteous life, a holy life, an upright life. And when you're living like that, to depart from evil, that is wisdom. And when you depart from evil, and you're showing that wisdom, then you're telling disobedient people who are disobedient to the heavenly vision. They're disobedient to the word of the Lord. You are turning their hearts back to the wisdom of the just, making ready a people prepared unto the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 12, verse 47. Luke chapter 12, verse 47. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. How do we prepare? It says, the servant that knows his master's will and prepared not himself, neither did the will of the, of the master. The fellow is not prepared. When the Lord says, repent, do the will of the master, repent. When the Lord says, restore, do the will of the master, restore. When the Lord says, correct the faults in your life, do the will of the master and correct the faults in your life. When the Lord says, occupy until I come, get occupied in the work of the Lord until he comes. The servant that knows his master's will and prepared not himself and did not do the will of the father, when the master comes, the fellow is not prepared and he will be beaten with many stripes. Revelation chapter, chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. You are saved, ready. You are sanctified and cleansed and poured and purified, ready. And then your garment of righteousness remains clean, remains pure, remains white, ready. It says his wife has made herself ready. Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, we're reading from verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey each in the laws thereof. That's how to get prepared. Temptation will come. Challenges will come. And the tempters and temptresses will come to you. They will want to tempt you and lure you back into sin. But it says, let not sin. Therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey each in the laws thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. They'll ask you for members of your body, for your hand to write the wrong receipt, and for your eyes to look at pornography, and for your emotion to be drawn towards something, an object of sin, and for your ear to hear the worldly music. They'll introduce it to you, but you will not yield any of your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of righteousness 
unto God. That same Romans chapter 6 verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, a servant seer to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God besides that ye were servants of sin, ye were in the past, but now, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Those are the people that are getting ready, and I pray you'll be ready. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Getting ready for the coming of the Lord. If ye then be risen from uh, with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. You are risen with Christ. You are identified with Christ in his resurrection. Seek the things which are above. Set your affections on things above, and not on things on the earth. Set your affections on things above, and not on things on earth. Look up here. Let, let's assume if we were handling certain scripture, and the said the scripture was teaching, was teaching you, and the said your teacher will ask you, now it says, set your affection on things above, not on things, plural, plural, things on the earth. And then you'll say, my brother there, give me an example of things on earth. My sister there, give me an example of things on the earth. And then, as we begin to share together, you'll begin to find out the things on earth that people are searching their affection. And you cannot set your affection on two things at the same time. Things above, that's where to set your affection. Not things on the earth. And then even though I'm not able to ask you one by one because it's a large crowd, you can begin to think about it yourself. What are the things your attention is set on? Your mind is set on. Your affection is set on. Your love is set on. Are there houses? Is it riches? Is it wealth? Is it prosperity? Is it mundane thing, a mundane thing of this world? What are you setting your mind on? It says, if we're going to be ready and prepared for the coming of the Lord, set your affection on things above, not on things of death. Where Christ, where you, for ye are dead, and your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, it's talking about the coming of the Lord. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. If you look at this page, this is preparation and perseverance of the overcomers. Overcomers. Again, I told you what I was uh, dealing with the introduction. When it says watch, there must be something to watch over. And when it says Overcomers, there must be something to overcome. Uh, for example, uh, you look at somebody, and this fellow is overweight. He doesn't run, he doesn't jump, he doesn't do exercise. It's like he has no confrontation about anything with anything in his life. He's flabby, he's careless, he almost cannot carry himself. And then you say, are you an overcomer? He says, yes, I'm an overcomer. Then we ask him, have you fought any battle before? Have you fought any enemy before? Have you overcome any challenge, any difficulty before? He says, no, I just wake up and sleep and eat and then sleep and then wake up and eat. I have never faced any battle, any conflict. I have never engaged any enemy. How do you call yourself an overcomer? An overcomer is somebody that has engaged an enemy. And that enemy faced you, and then you fought against that enemy, and you defeated the enemy. That is an overcomer. Now, for a Christian, preparing for the coming of the Lord, what are you overcoming that makes you an overcomer? Number one is the tempter and principalities and powers. Overcomers. These are the overcomers. The people that engage the enemy and they fight against the enemy and they conquer and they defeat the enemy. Number one enemy, the tempter. 
the principalities and the powers. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual darkness in high places. Those are overcomers. They are wrestling. And because they wrestle against the tempter, and against principalities and powers, and they overcame. That's how they became overcomers. Number two, trials and persecution. Trials and persecution. When trial comes against you, and then you are not so flabby, and you are not so careless, and you are not, you just don't give up and say, what can I do? I cannot, if you can't do anything, you're not overcome. But when the, tent, when the trial comes, when the persecution comes, and then you fight against the persecution, and you stand in the persecution, then you overcome the persecutor, and you overcome in the trial. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. Before Christ comes, there will be trials. If you have not passed through any trial yet, they still come in. Because the devil will try people. He'll try your faith. He'll try your love. He'll try your conviction. He'll try your commitment. And when you stand and you say, here is what, where I stand. This is my conviction. I will not yield to the devil in this trial. Those are the overcomers. Overcomers are the people that fight against something and they overcome. And they prevail. Number three, temptations and pressure. Temptations and pressure. Temptation will come. It, uh, you know, it will want to draw your flesh and your mind towards things that are evil. The things you see can become temptation. And the things you hear can become avenues of temptation. And the things you feel can become avenues of temptation. The things you desire, I want to have this, I want to have this, I want to have this, can become a temptation. Yeah, you see the car. Every time you see a new car, you want to buy a new car. And yeah, you see some good dresses. Every time you see dress on another person, you want a new dress. And you are having a good job. Every time you have testimony, another person has got a job, you want to quit and get a new job. And yeah, you see some good equipment. Every time you hear another person has something better, you want to draw that and use another one. It can become a temptation to you. And when you overcome in that temptation, you overcome the tempter and the principalities and powers. You overcome the trial and the persecution. You overcome the temptation and the pressure. That's when you become an, an overcomer. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown, the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted. When he is drawn away of his own lust, of his own desires, of his own aspiration, of his own ambition, of his own inner inward leanings, then it says in verse, uh, in verse and it's enticed in verse 15, then when loss has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. But if you overcome, every temptation coming your way, challenging your Christian life, that's when you'll be able to say, I prepared for the coming of the Lord. Number one, the tempter and principalities and powers. Number two, trial and persecution. Number three, temptations and pressure. Number four, the traps of prosperity. The traps of prosperity. You know, prosperity itself can become a dangerous thing for you. And there are people that they deserve prosperity to the point they lose their soul. It tells us in First Timothy chapter 6 and in verse 9. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is a trap. It's what they use in catching animals. And you know, you know the snares, you know the traps. If you've been in the village before, they might put a palm kernel 
or they might put another face like a bitch and they put it on that trap and because that rabbit is so much eager I must get it I must have it I must hold it because he's so eager that's why he runs into the trap he tells us the way they catch monkeys in the village the way they catch monkeys in the village maybe in some villages there will be a jug but it will be a glass transparent jug then they will put granules and uh, banana right banana inside that jug and it will be so done in such a way that when the monkey, when he wants to put his hand into the jug, the hand will enter. Then he will pull the banana. If he holds the banana or the ground nut, want him to pull his hand out, he will not be able to pull the hand out. And the monkey, he will experiment, experiment a lot of times. He'll drop the uh, banana, he'll drop the ground nut, and remove his hand, the hand will come out. But say, no, I must have this thing. If I don't have it, I'm defeated. Then he puts in his hand again, then he holds banana, and then the hand will not come out. He drops it, his hand will not come out. Say, no, there must be a way to get this thing. You see the ambition that you have. Wanting to grab that thing, wanting to have that thing, it must be mine. The traps of prosperity. It can lure you away from the Lord. The monkey will keep on doing that, putting in the hand, not able to bring it out until the hunter comes and catches him alive. And that hunter is the devil. And the devil has caught many, many people because of the trap of prosperity. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, a trial, into many and into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Number five, the thirst for power and popularity. The thirst for power and popularity. You see, there are some people, they are not satisfied with the place God has given them, with the position God has given them, with the honor God has given them, with the praise God has given them. They are not satisfied with the place they occupy. They are always looking up. They are always looking up. And they get into the search for power and the search for popularity. You see, that was the case with Absalom in Second Samuel chapter 15. Second Samuel chapter 15. I'm reading there to you from verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared himself chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which has any suit, any problem or cause, might come unto me, that I will would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, that's to prostrate and to show some respect, he put forth his hand and he took him and he kissed him. On this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. The thirst for power and the thirst for popularity. Can I remind you that before this time, actually, Absalom had arranged killing uh, one of the sons of David, one of the sons of the king, his son of brother. And then he ran away. And eventually, even though he ran away, David said, you'll not see my face. That's a crime. And in the land of Israel, he should have been killed, but he wasn't killed. And then Job pleaded for him. Eventually, he came back. And the king said, all right, I'll pardon him. He can live in the city, but let him stay in his place. Even that forgiveness and the mercy and the grace was not enough for him. And the very fact that his life had been spared, he wasn't free to live. But forgiveness made him to live. And now he was free. And now he was doing that. He wanted position. He wanted popularity. 
and he stole the minds and the hearts of the people away. And there are people like that today. The place God has given them, that's not enough. The position God has given them, that's not enough. The privilege the Lord has given them, that's not enough. They are thirsty for power and thirsty for popularity. And it's a great temptation. And if you don't overcome that thirst, it can hinder you from getting to heaven. Look at Second Samuel chapter 18. In Second Samuel chapter 18, reading from verse 15. And the ten young men that bear Joah's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. A war ensued because of the thirst for power and popularity. Eventually, in verse 17, and he took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him. And all this threat fled every man, every one to his tent. He died a sinner. He died a rebel. He died a criminal. He died and went to hell because of the thirst for power. Absalom. If he had enjoyed his forgiveness, if he had stayed quietly somewhere, saying, I'm not fit to live. The king has pardoned me, and the king has allowed me to live. This is enough for me. I'm going to live a quiet life, a peaceful life, a righteous life, till the end of my life. But that was not enough. Position, popularity, power, politics. He wanted it at all costs. He died prematurely and went to hell. Now, number six, the terror of princes. The terror of princes. You see where, where you are walking, your place of work, there are princes there. In your community where you live, there are princes there. And those princes, they'll be demanding that you compromise. And they will terrify you. If you don't overcome that terror of the princes, you'll not be able to make it in the rapture. Because the rapture is for the people who are prepared and who persevere as overcomers. In First Peter chapter 3 verse 14. First Peter chapter 3 verse 14. But, but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Don't be afraid of the terror of the princes. And then number seven, transgression and pride. Transgression and pride. And there's nothing that God hates like pride. He hates pride because of the very nature of the devil. In First John chapter 2 verse 16, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I pray will be overcome us. In First John chapter 5 verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith we shall overcome. Amen. Point number two, paying the price to overcome. Paying the price to overcome. Now when we talk about paying the price, I want you to understand. It's like, a, you know, this salvation is wonderful. I said salvation is wonderful. You know, it's like the Lord has given you scholarship to go to heaven. You know, somebody is studying and he wants to go to school. And the parents have nothing to pay. And he himself has nothing to pay. And then the government gives him scholarship. And says, you can go to the best school. That's wonderful. That it is free. Education is free for you. Scholarship, accommodation there, everything is free. But, even though there is scholarship, even though there's free education, even though the books are free, even though the accommodation is free, you still have to pay a price. The price of going to class. The price of reading. The price of studying. Yes, scholarship is there. But scholarship will not give you certificate. Salvation is free. It's like a scholarship. The Lord has saved us because of what he has done. Because he died for us on the cross of Calvary. It's like a scholarship. Here is a ticket for you. Here is scholarship for you. Come on. You can get to heaven. But you still have to read the Bible. You still have to learn the promises. And you still have to overcome temptation. And that's very simple. Because the greater part has been done. The greater part is a scholarship. Which you couldn't afford yourself. And now, the little you can do. 
which is to study, which is to obey, which is to carry on in the way of the Lord, in the work of the Lord, all that you ought to do as a price you pay. Let me show you the price Christ has paid already. And because of the price he has paid, that's why we're rejoicing that we're going to heaven. The scholarship has been given to us. Now, after you got that scholarship, you too, you must do your own part. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom for all to testify, to be testified in due time. That's a scholarship. He gave himself for your salvation. You don't have to do anything at all. Turn away from your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Scholarship. And then he tells us Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. He gave himself, he gave himself, he gave himself. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us. It's knowledge for our salvation. It's free. Salvation is free. Forgiveness is available. The grace of God is available. Whosoever will may come. That's your scholarship right there. He has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling in savor. You see, for the second time I read to you, he gave himself in Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins. You see that? He gave himself that we might be saved. There is nobody that will say, because I don't have enough money to pay, because I didn't have enough good works, and because I didn't do this, I didn't do that, that's why I could not be saved. He gave himself our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a scholarship. Salvation is free. He gave himself for me. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Christ gave himself. He paid the price. He did the greatest sin, what you couldn't do for your salvation. Titus chapter 2 verse 14, who gave himself for us. Very clear. Says he so many times. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for each. He has given himself. He has given himself for our salvation. He has given himself for redemption. He has given himself for forgiveness. He has given himself for purification, for our holiness, and for sanctification. Now that the price has been paid by Christ, and now you come into the kingdom of God on scholarship. You come unto the, into the kingdom of God on the basis of what he has done, on the basis of what he has accomplished. Then, do you still have to do anything? Yes. I'm determined to hold on to the end. Jesus is with me, and on him and I, can, I can depend. And I know I have salvation, for I feel it in my soul. I am determined to hold on to the end. That holding on to the end, that's the part you play. Yes, he paid the greatest price. And freely we come into the kingdom of God. And yet, if that child going to school has scholarship, and now he says, thank God I have scholarship. And I'm in class, I'm in school. I'm at the university now on the basis of government scholarship. I will not reach, will not go to class, will not do assignment, will not labor, will not pay the price to succeed, scholarship alone will not make him to get a certificate. Pay the price. What's the price? Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. The same thing with you, my brother, my sister, your purpose in your heart. You determine, now that I've been saved by the free grace of the Lord, 
I'm going to pay the price. I will not defile myself with the idols and the pollutions of the land. First Timothy chapter 6. In First Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight against the loss of the flesh. Fight against the pride of life. And fight against the loss of the eyes. Fight the good fight of faith. Flee. All deceit, the Lord may come to you, flee. And Potiphar's wife may come to you, flee. And the people of the world may invite you to become a friend of the world. Flee. Because whosoever will be a friend of the world will be an enemy of God. And then you follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading verse 27. But I keep my body under. I keep my body under. Put that body under control. What does that mean? I put my body under. Look up here. Does that mean that I shall crawl under this pulpit? Then you call me. Pastor, come and pray for us. No, I'm putting my body under. Pastor, come and counsel us. Baby, don't you see me? I said I'm putting my body under. Is that what it means? Put your mouth under control. Put your eyes under control. Put your ears under control. Put your legs under control. Cannot walk to the pop house. Cannot walk to the drinking bar. And then put your hands under control. Don't raise up your hand and slap your wife. Put it under control. Put your temper, temperament under control. You see, the world in which we live, not everybody will do things we will love and like. There are times people will do things you will not like, and the devil will make a suggestion to you. How can they talk to you like that? Open your mouth and abuse them. Put your mouth under control. Hear that music and see the other young boys and girls dancing by the street corner. Join them and begin to dance. Don't you know how to dance? Uh-uh. Put your legs under control. I put my body under. That's what it means. So that when temptation comes, the temptation to talk rubbish, the temptation to gossip, or the temptation to see bad things, or the temptation to hear bad things, or the temptation to write a bad letter, a letter of uh, immorality, when the temptation comes for you to leave your wife and then get near another woman, suggestion will come, but you put your body under. And then it says, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. I bring it, I bring it into subjection. I say, eyes, you are not Lord over me, I'm Lord over you, be close. Don't look at that thing. My ears. Don't respond to that noise you are hearing over there. You will not be Lord over me. I, my spirit, is strong enough. For the spirit of the conqueror, I put my ears under control. My legs will not walk just anywhere you want. I'm in control. I'm in charge. If your legs are in charge, your legs are stronger than your heart. Your hands are stronger than your heart. Your mouth is stronger than your heart. And your heart, your spirit, it's not the spirit of the conqueror. And your spirit is not the captain in your life. Then you are not going to live a righteous life. It means whatever the hands wants to do, they will do. Whatever the legs, wherever the legs want to go, they will go. Whatever the mouth wants to speak, they will speak. No. Let the captain be the captain. And let the captain be in charge and be in control. And say, my body, you are under control. I will can keep it under control. I said we can keep it under control. See as we are sitting down. You know sometimes I'm in the middle of a particular point and then you're feeling like going to the toilet. But you're in control. And you say no. And it appears that if you don't go to the toilet in five minutes that you might mess up things and you say no. Sit down. 
I didn't tell you to see now, but you told yourself you are in charge. I said you are in charge. Yes. You know, sometimes it's like uh, you are hungry. And then you are hearing the word of God. As you are hungry, you are, maybe you put your hand on your tummy and say, be quiet. Or maybe you just neglect it and just overlook it and say, I am going to listen to the word of God till the end. I am in charge. If you can be in charge for one hour at the Bible study, you can be in charge for another one hour, and in charge for another one hour, you can be in charge for a whole day. I said, I can be in charge for a whole day. And then, there's some of you that are not married, and you, you've been waiting for 32 years, you have been in control, and you have been in charge, and you have told your body, I am going to heaven. Marriage will come at the same time. How you see it if you have waited for 32 years, and you have been in charge and control for 32 years, you can still be in control for one more year. I said you can be in control for one more year. It can be done. And God will give you grace. So that by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself should not be a castaway. You will not be a castaway. I come to point number three. Promises and provision for the overcomer. Promises and provision for the overcomer. We're looking at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 22. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. The promises Christ has made. The provision God has given to the overcomer. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We shall be saved. In Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, we're reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34, it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time, watch that, lest at any time, lest at any time, can you look up here for a moment, you know, and we will go through many stages in life, any time. You know, sometimes when there's no job, when there's no money, when it's persecution, when your relatives, your friends, when they forsake you, when people of the world, when they threaten you, sometimes you are very strong because you pray more and you lean upon the Lord. And when they say, where is your God? You are crying. You are saying, oh God, I will not leave you. They are telling me I'm going to backslide. I'm going to prove to them I will not backslide. And then God looks at your faithfulness. He looks at your stability and steadfastness. And then times change. Now there's prosperity. Now there is joy. Now you have a car. Now you have everything. And the seriousness of the time of difficulty evaporates away. Now you run to work without quiet time. Now you talk and talk and talk without prayer. You are not doing that before when times were at all. When things were difficult, you were very, very prayerful. But now everything is easy. Let's at any time. Other people, when God has provided for them, that's when they will backslide. When they were poor, no job, no wife, and they were praying to God, they, you could fast at that time. Seven days you are fasting because you are asking for this, you are asking for this. And eventually God looks at your faithfulness and gives you a child. And then after you've got first child, second child, third child, then we say, Ah, sister, you are not at the uh, hospital. Ah, pastor. Coordinator. Three children to take care of them. Huh. It's now understand the duty of a mother. The blessing is taking heaven away from you. Let's at any time. You know, some people who have been praying for them, they say, Pastor, pray for me that I will get a job. If I have a job, I'll serve the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. Now, what do you do in the church? I'm an usher. I'm also doing this. I'm also doing that. Wonderful. Then we say, oh God, look at this faithful brother, this faithful sister. Bless her, bless him, and then the Lord blesses you. After the Lord has blessed you now, then you come to tell us, now I've got a job, but I'm also doing evening classes somewhere. Evening classes, then job, then I'm traveling overseas, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, until you cannot read Bible anymore. You totally backslide because of the blessing. If you were following the Lord in hard times, now when things are going easy, keep on following the Lord, you'll not backslide in Jesus' name. 
Yes, but any time your heart be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life and cares of this life and cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares, for the snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You'll be among the people that will stand before the Son of Man on that day in Jesus' name. And the Lord says he'll give us blessing. He'll give us provision. What are the things the Lord will give us? Number one, eternal life. Eternal life, everlasting life, will be forever and ever with the Lord. It says in Titus chapter 1 verse 2, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie has promised, promised before the world began, eternal life. When Christ shall come, and then we go with him, he will grant us, number one, eternal life, number two, eternal home, eternal home. In Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Eternal hope. Number three, everlasting joy. In Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 10. And the ransom of the Lord shall return. And come to Zion was sung, and everlasting joy upon their heads. Everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall flee away. Number one, eternal life. Number two, eternal home. Number three, everlasting joy. Number four, eternal excellency. Eternal excellency. That the Lord himself has promised the people that will follow him. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 15. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 15. Whereas thou hast been for, forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy to many generations. I pray you will not lose that in Jesus' name. Yeah. Number, number five, eternal glory. Eternal glory. In Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, for a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Eternal glory. Number six, eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, these are the things that the Lord has promised and provided for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the false testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance the promise of eternal inheritance number seven eternal incorruptible crown eternal incorruptible crown in first corinthians chapter 9 verse 25 and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible incorruptible crown the lord will give it to you and the Lord will give it to me. The time is about ready, and the Lord is coming again. And the Lord is saying, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed are those people that watch, so that nobody will take your crown. You will wear a crown, and you will rejoice forever and ever. And it remains just a little time. And who knows, the very next moment, the trumpet may sound. You have been enduring for all these years. You have been a Christian, some of you, for 30 years. Some 25, some 20, some 17, and some just about 3 years. Or maybe just recently. And you have gone through a lot, a lot. And what remains is a very small thing. It's like a child who has been in school for about, uh, you know, primary school about six years, and then secondary school another six years, 12 years, and then in the last, uh, last session, or the last uh, moment, 
Maybe if the teacher did something, it was too hard and too difficult. And just because of the few months remaining, he said, I cannot be at this one. And then he runs away and he quits. And then he loses the value and the reward of all the years of studying because of just this momentary problem. I'm here to tell you, God has helped you until this time. And it will help you until the end. All that you have gone through will not be a waste. And all the grace of God in your life that you have endured until this time, whatever still remains, the grace of God will be sufficient in your life in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, see me through until the very end. See me through until the very end. If you are not born again yet, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then come into the kingdom of God and the Lord will help you. And for those of us brothers and sisters, you have known the Lord. You have come to know the Lord as your personal Savior. Why don't you say, Lord, hold my hand. Christ has paid the whole price and a little thing for you to do. Just endure to the end and have a purpose of heart. A purpose of heart that you will not deny the Lord. Whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever difficulty, whatever challenge that you will hold on to the very end. Don't give up. Don't give up. The Lord is on your side. And the Lord is going to help you. He'll help you to the very end. If you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the time to say, Lord, I surrender my heart to you. I surrender my life to you. I give myself completely unto you. You turn away from sin. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He has paid the whole price already. He has died for you. So that he will take your sins away. Say, yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe you died for me. I believe you died to take my sins away. I believe you died so that I can be saved. Give your life to the Lord. He will forgive your sin. He will change your life. You'll never be the same again. He'll write your name in the book of life. It's inviting you. Come unto me. All ye that live on a heavy lady. And I will give you rest. Rest from your life of sin. Rest from your sorrow. Rest from all the challenges in your life. And then he says, I'll give you my grace. I will hold your hand. He paid the price already. He paid the price already. He cried, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. It's like he has given you scholarship to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Scholarship to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, all that remains is to make up your mind and determine to hold out to the end. Jesus is with me. On him I can depend. I know I have salvation. I feel it in my soul. I'm determined to hold on to the very end. It will hold your hand. It will keep you. It will help you. So that you will endure to the very end. When temptations come, look unto Jesus and overcome. When trials come, look unto Jesus and overcome. When the tempter, the temptress comes to you, look unto Jesus and overcome. Consecrate your life. Make up your mind. Christ is coming. He can come any moment from now. Christ is coming. And it can come any moment from now. You have been saved, remain saved. Remain faithful to the Lord. I keep my body under. You'll keep your mouth from gossiping. You keep your eyes from seeing beholding evil. You keep your legs from going places that are not according to the will of God. You keep your mind stayed on the word of God. You keep your heart with all diligence. You keep your thoughts on things sanctifying. 
you'll keep your mission in the center of the will of God. You will not allow the thirst for power and the thirst for popularity to make you go astray like Absalom. Do not allow anything of this world to make you deny the Lord. Hold on to the very end. Live a day at a time, a moment at a time. And the Lord is able to see you through. He helped you yesterday, He'll help you today. And He will help you tomorrow. The God of yesterday is the God of today and is the God of tomorrow. Keep on looking unto Jesus, the author, and the finisher of your faith. And He's able to keep you faithful to the very end. Don't allow your flesh to be in control. Let your spirit arise and be in control. Don't live a careless life. A worthless life. A prayerless life. An unprepared life. Live a life. That will show that you are getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Live a life that will show you are getting ready for the coming of the Lord. The Lord will help you. If you are backsliding, come back to the Lord. There's still chance this moment. We cannot promise you tomorrow. This is the accepted time. This is the day of salvation, the day of restoration. If you have compromised with sin, if you have compromised with sinners, compromised with the people of the world, you can tell the Lord you are sorry. And be washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb again. Be ready, the Lord is coming. Be ready, the Lord is coming. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garment. Let's decision. shame. Tell the Lord you will be ready. Tell the Lord you will be ready. You'll pay the price, whatever others do. Purpose of heart. Determination, dedication to follow the Lord till the very end. You will not allow your flesh to conquer you. You will not allow the world to conquer you. You will not allow Satan to conquer you. You'll be a conqueror. You'll be more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. You will not allow a Delilah to conquer you. Neither will you allow Potiphar's wife to conquer you. Be more than a conqueror. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Say, Lord, I will stand. The Lord will help you. Just a little time, and the Lord may come. You have been standing firm all these years. How are you going to allow the temptation of a moment to destroy the faithfulness of many years from your life? 
stand. Stand. With the mind of a conqueror, stand. With the spirit of a conqueror, stand. With the boldness of a courageous captain in charge of everything in your body, be in control. Don't allow a little thing to pull you away from the kingdom. Be steadfast and unmovable. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Ye shall be hated of all men, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. He that shall endure to the end, he that shall endure to the end, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Tell the Lord, give me the grace. Give me the strength. Give me the divine enablement to stand in righteousness and holiness to the very end. And I will give it to you. Because he wants you in heaven. He has gone to prepare a place for you. And he wants you to be fully prepared for that place.